form AX squared plus BX plus C. A, B, and C are just numbers of whatever flavor. Uh, and if we're going to solve that thing, we need it equal to zero. If it's in standard form, if it's got the AX squared, the BX, and a C, we need it equal to zero to be able to solve it. What that does is it opens up a lot of options as far as the ways of solving it. The first option is going to be by factoring. So we're going to start working on solving by factoring. So this just bridges um, what we did in labs with exactly what we're doing here. So solving by factoring employs what's called the zero product property. And the zero product property, what it says, and this is just kind of a, maybe help you understand why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, it says that if you multiply two things together, or more things together, and the answer is equal to zero, then at least one of those is zero. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is looking at quadratics, and if they're already in factored form, like the ones that we worked with in labs, for example, one that might be factored as x plus 7 and x minus 5. If it's equal to zero, that's two different, two separate things that are multiplied together, x plus 7 times x minus 5. That's two things multiplied together. If that's equal to zero, then at least one of these is, is zero. We're going to take, well, what if both of them are? Because what's zero times zero? Still zero, right? So it could be both of them that are zero. They both have a variable in them. So we don't know which one of them it is. So we're going to assume that it's both of them. So what we're going to do is set each factor equal to zero. So this one was already factored for us. Once you get it factored, you're going to set each individual factor that has a variable, you're going to set it equal to zero, and then you've got an easy equation to solve. X plus 7 equals zero. How do you get X by 7? Minus seven. Minus seven. X equals negative seven. On the other one, you add five. X equals five. You've got two answers. Anytime you've got a quadratic equation, quadratic means it's got an X squared in the problem. That's the biggest power of X. Then you're going to have two answers. It may be the same answer twice, but it's still two answers. This one is two different answers. You got a negative seven and a positive five. That's two answers to this problem. That's what you're going to find when you're uh, solving quadratics, no matter what method we use. So let's look at one that maybe isn't factored for us yet. So x squared plus 7x plus 12 is equal to zero. So this one is more like what we, we wrote up at, at the top of our notes. It's in standard form. We got ax squared plus bx plus c, and then it's equal to zero. So we have a standard form uh, quadratic that's ready for us to do some factoring to, to solve it. So we're using the method of factoring at this time. We're going to learn some other methods. But factoring, that's the x thing. So pretend this equals zero is not even here. And let's factor it like we did on the, on the last. What goes up top? 12. What goes in the bottom of the x? Multiply to be 12, add to be 7. 3 and 4. Can I use the shortcut on the factoring for this one? Yes. Why? There's nothing in front of the x squared, so that allows me to go straight to my factors, x plus 3, x plus 4. So having to, you know, knowing when you can use that shortcut is going to be helpful because now factoring is not the end of the game. There's more to do after that. So we, if we got that shortcut available, then let's use it because we got we got to do some other work. Okay. So now we've got it looking like example A. What do we do with the x plus three and the x plus four? Set them equal to zero. So x plus three equals zero. X plus four equals zero. Solve them. Subtract three. X equals negative three. That's one answer. Subtract four. X equals negative four. That's the other answer.
So using our factoring, we can set it up to where we can set them equal to zero. That's using the zero product property and get there. Let's look at this one. 6x squared plus 7x is equal to 3. What's wrong with this one compared to example B? It's equal to 3. We need it to be equal to what? Zero. So what we need to do is move that 3 over there with the other stuff so it looks like standard form and it gets equal to zero. How do we move that 3? Subtract 3. Goes away. So there's the zero. And then we go into descending order here. So 6x squared plus 7x minus 3. Then I go into my factoring steps. So the first thing I look for is the GCF. And the reason I think of that is because I got a number in front of x squared. I'm hoping that there might be a GCF so I can get rid of that. Uh, 6, 7, and 3. Mm, the 7 messes everything up, right? So it doesn't work. So we got to go to our x method for that. So what goes on the top of the x for this one? Negative 18 on the bottom. Seven. So we need things that multiply to be negative 18 and add to be 7. 9 and a negative 2. 9 times negative 2 is negative 18. 9 plus negative 2 is positive 7. Can I use the shortcut on this one? No. So i got to do it the long way, which is not that hard. It just takes a little more time. So I'm replacing the 7x with the 9x and the negative 2x. I'm going to group the first two together. What's the GCF of those first two? 3x. Yeah. So that's going to give us 2x plus 3. Because what times this 3x that I pulled out would give me 6x squared and a 2 and an x. What times this 3x would give me a 9x and then a 3. Okay. Now, what do I pull out of these two? Does negative 2 go into negative 3? No. Negative 1 goes into both of them. It doesn't change the numbers any, but it changes their signs. So negative 1, and then that'll change that to a positive 2x and that to a positive 3. And now the parentheses match. That's the only way to make that happen. So if nothing else is in common between that second pair uh, in your grouping, it's going to be a 1 or a negative 1 that you're going to pull out. And I remember that sign right there that I was going to take. So pulling out a minus 1 there. So I've got two factors. i got 3x minus 1 and 2x plus 3. Again, doesn't matter what order you put those in. What do I do with each of those? Set them equal to zero and solve. So 3x minus 1 equals zero. 2x plus 3 equals zero. Add 1. 3x equals 1. Divide by 3. Get a fraction, one third. And that's okay. Track 3. Divide by 2. We get another fraction, negative 3 over 2. Taking my quadratic and I'm using factoring uh, to solve that. So it's the same factoring that we used in labs tonight. It's nothing different. Exactly the same thing. Now, what I want to show you is kind of a connection to this and the graphs. Okay, so if I go back, let's just go all the way back to example A, and I'm going to pull out my graphing calculator, and I want to show you guys the connection that, that happens here. So example A, the problem was x plus 7 times x minus 5. So I'm going to put in parentheses x plus 7 and then another set of parentheses x minus 5. I'm sure I got that. Right. Yeah, that's the right equation. All right. Then I'm going to hit graph with my calculator. Just hit graph. Look where 
that graph is crossing the x-axis. One, two, three, four, five. What was one of our answers? Five. Negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, negative five, negative six, negative seven. The other answer was negative seven, right? The connection is when we solve these things and get it equal to zero, we're finding where that thing crosses the x-axis. So if you're stuck on one, you're not sure what to do, graph it. See where it crosses the x-axis. That'll give you a great idea of where to start. Okay? Look at example B. Example B, you've got x squared plus 7x plus 12 equal to zero. So it's already equal to zero. So I'm just going to graph it. x squared plus 7x plus 12. We'll hit graph. Look where it's hitting the x-axis at. Negative 3, negative 4. What were the answers we found on example B? Negative 3, negative 4. So we're, we're seeing the connection between the factoring that we've done and the graph of that polynomial, okay? Example C, this is the one that had the fraction answers. The thing I've got to remember, though, is I need to use the, where it's equal to zero. I can't use the original because it's equal to three. I need to use the part that's equal to zero. I'm going to copy in 6x squared plus 7x minus three in my calculator and graph it. 6x squared plus 7x. Oops, let me clear all that out. 6x squared plus 7x minus 3. So whatever it's equal to zero at. Now this one's a little harder to see where it's at exactly, but we see here between zero and positive one that it's crossing the x-axis. That'd be our positive. What is it? One third? What that was? And then over here between negative one and negative two that that's the negative three over two that we found okay so we can tell we got the right answers when we graphed it uh or when we factored it because the answers we got fit where it's crossing the x-axis that's what we're finding is where it's crossing the x-axis all right let's look at sample d x squared minus 16 equals zero It's equal to zero already, so that's a good thing. But what's missing on this one? The B in the middle, right? So uh, this one has two terms with a minus sign in the middle. What does that make us think it might be? Money whispered it. Say it a little louder. A difference of squares, yeah. How can I check? Well, try to rewrite it. As a difference of squares. What square gets me x squared? X. What square gets me 16? 4. It works. I can rewrite it that way. What are the factors? X plus 4. X minus 4, right? Set each of those equal to 0. Positive 4, negative 4. If I graph that with my calculator, x squared minus 16. The original one where it was equal to 0, look where it's crossing the x-axis. Positive 4 and negative 4. When we have real solutions, which is what we're having right now because we're using factoring, uh, then we'll see where it's crossing the x-axis should match the numbers we're finding when we factor. Should always match that. Okay, now this is where we're going to kind of depart away from factoring a little bit and try to learn some new methods for, for solving these things. And this one, it, let's talk about solving by square roots. And this problem, if it had been written x squared is equal to 16, and it wasn't x squared minus 16, it was 0, it's the same problem. But the difference is, instead of having it equal to zero, how do you undo a square? 
take the square root. So if I took the square root of the left side, it would just give me plain old x, right? Which is what I'm looking for. That's what I'm trying to find. Just what does x equal? So if I take the square root of the left side, I got to take the square root of the right side. The difference is I need two answers. So what two numbers could I square and get 16? Four, four times four is 16. What else? Same, same kind of idea. If positive four times positive four is 16. Negative four and negative four. That negative four squared is also 16. So there's a positive and a negative side. So when I put the square root in the problem, I've got to put a plus or minus in front of it. And then simplify the square root. Square root of 16, I know is 4. So I get two answers. X equals positive 4. X equals negative 4. That's the exact same two answers that I got when I did it by factoring. If I moved the 16 over and got X squared minus 16, it's back to example D. It's the same one. Okay? So this one we could solve by square roots. Why can this one be solved by square roots and none of the others that we've done so far in the lecture be solved by square roots? What's the difference in example D and E compared to the A, B, and C? They weren't missing the D. They all had a plain X term. If you've got the plain X term, square roots is out. You can't use it. Okay? But if you don't have the, X, the plain X, the B, X part, Square roots is a great option because it's quicker. That was a lot quicker than all that stuff was, right? That, that can be helpful, okay? And let's look at example F. X squared is equal to 18. If I tried to do that with factoring, is X squared minus 18 a difference of squares? Is there anything squared that gives me 18? No, it won't factor. So I can't do that one by factor. So this is where being able to do it by square roots is handy. So now I can just say, oh, take the square root of both sides, put a plus and minus in front of the one that's in front of all the number. Always put a plus and minus. And if you put the square root in the problem yourself to solve it, you've got to put plus or minus in front. Now, does 18 have a nice square root? No. So we need to simplify that. So 6 times 3, 2 times 3, there's a pair of 3's. Plus or minus 3, radical 2. Positive 3, radical 2 is an answer. Negative 3, radical 2 is an answer. If I want to check this with the calculator and the graph, what do I have to get the problem equal to first? zero so if i'm going to check it with the graph i've got to get it equal to zero so i when i graph this i have to graph x squared minus 18. x squared minus 18. now is that positive three radical two can you eyeball that <laughs> No, I can't. I don't know what that is. It's a decimal off the top of my head. I'd have to type it in the guy. It is. That, that's where that spot's at. So what you could do is say, okay, what's uh, I, on my calculator, I'd go to the, I'd say, 3 square root of 2. Get the decimal 4.2, so it's a little bit past 4. And if I go to my graph, is that a little bit past 4? Yeah. So I, I'm pretty sure I got it right. That's how you can check with the graph or when you're solving by square roots. you got to still get it equal to zero, but then do the decimal equivalent of that. Now, example G, 8x squared is equal to 56. Uh-oh, more numbers. Does it, what's this one still missing? 
the BX part, right? So that means square roots is the quickest way to solve it. Anytime you're missing the BX part, square roots is the quickest way to get an answer, okay? And if I'm gonna take the square root of both sides, what has to be by itself? The X squared, right? How to get rid of this eight? If I divide by eight, it'll get rid of it and leave me X squared is equal to seven. Now what? Take the square root. Once you get X squared by itself, take the square root of both sides. Plus or minus on the number side. Will the square root of seven simplify any? Plus or minus, square root of seven. Square root of seven would be somewhere between uh, two and three. So if I graph X squared uh, minus seven on the calculator, I'd see this thing crossing the x-axis at uh, two point something and negative two point something out of that. All right. We'll get sample H. X squared plus four is equal to zero. <coughs> X squared plus four is equal to zero. Yeah. If it was X squared minus four, we'd have a difference of squares, right? Be X plus two and X minus two, but it's not. It's X squared plus four. So we know it doesn't factor because it's not a difference of squares. But what's it missing? The BX. So I could solve this by what? Square roots. But what do I need to get by itself? X. So subtract the 4. X squared is equal to negative 4. And now X squared by itself. Take the square root of both sides. But I'm taking the square root of a negative. Uh oh. What's the square root of negative 4? 2i. So I get two complex solutions here. Here's the, the, the part where checking with the graph starts to drift away. Because if I graph x squared plus 4, that's what was equal to 0 at the beginning. Where's that crossing the x-axis at? It's not crossing the x-axis at all, right? So we can't check this one with the graph because it's got complex solutions. It doesn't cross the x-axis. It's got answers, but they don't they don't show up on the graph. That's that's what happens when we have complex ones. Uh, so uh, if you got real solutions that are not don't have the i involved, then yeah, you can check them with the graph. But if you've got an i involved, the graph's really not going to help you uh, check your answers with that. Look at example I. Uh, negative 3x squared um, minus 4 is equal to 20. Well, that one's got a little bit more stuff going on. But what's it still missing? The BX. So the quickest way to get an answer is to use what? Square roots. So to use square roots, what do I need to get by itself? x squared. How do I do that with this problem? Add 4 to both sides. Good job. Negative 3x squared is equal to 24. Now what? Divide by negative 3. Oh, man. Negative 3 goes into 24 negative 8 times. Now what do I do? Yeah, I can just take the square root. It's got the x squared by itself. Got to do plus or minus on the number side. And then I need to simplify the square root of negative 8. So 8 is 4 times 2. 2 and 2. There's a pair of 2s. So plus or minus 2. And what else comes out?
I because it was a negative 8, right? Anytime there's a negative on the inside of a square root, that I comes out, always. And then what's on the inside of the square root? Two, that two that's right there that didn't have a buddy. And that one would not have crossed the x-axis if you graphed it. You've got it equal to zero and graphed it. So solving by square roots uh, can, can make it happen. Let's look at one that uh, maybe is a little bit more difficult. But it's still solving by square roots. What letter are we on here? J. Let's say we had x minus 2 squared is equal to um, let's just do 25. That's a good number. So is this one in the standard form that we started out the day with? Definitely not. It doesn't it doesn't have ax squared and it's got a plain X in it, but it's inside parentheses with a squared on it. Uh, and the C, uh, well, it's got two different plain numbers in there, so it's a little weird. All right, here's the kicker on this one. You got a squared part. This whole parentheses is squared. How could I get rid of that squared part? If I take the square root of that, it'll get rid of the squared on it. But if I take the square root of that side, what do I have to do to the other side? Take the square root. And because it's a number, I'm going to put a plus and minus in front of it. Okay? So on the left side, the square root cancels out the squared, and I just get x minus 2. And on the right-hand side, does 25 have a nice square root? Yeah, it's 5, right? So it's plus or minus 5. Now I can get x by itself, right? But how many equations do I have? I got two of them, right? Because x minus 2 is equal to positive 5 or negative 5. So I'm going to set up two equations. One of them is equal to positive 5. One is equal to negative 5. You just get x by itself on those. It's equal 7. Negative 3. Perfect. <coughs> a little bit more difficult. Looks a little fancier, but it's not any more steps. And, you know, it's just a maybe one more step than what we were doing. Um, Say so we had something like this. X... Uh, plus 7 squared uh, minus 6 is equal to um, just do 18. All right, so if we're going to try to do that one like we did example J, what do I need to do first? Can't do that yet. I need to get the 6 out of the way, right? Because I need the square root, the squared part to be isolated before I take square roots. So I need to get the like terms together. So I'm going to move that 6 first so that I get like terms together. And now it looks a lot more like example J did at the beginning. Now I've got something squared on one side and then a plain number on the other side. So now I can take the square roots of those. Plus or minus on the number side. So there's X plus 7. And then I need to simplify the square root of 24. So 6 and 4, 2 and 2, 3 and 2. So there's a pair of 2's. Plus or minus 2, radical 6. And is 2 radical 6 and the 7, are they like terms? Are they, they're both normal numbers. No, the 2 radical 6 
you can't really add it to the seven without converting to a decimal or something like that. So instead of setting it up as x plus seven equals positive two radical six and x plus seven equals negative two radical six, that just takes a lot of time and space. What I'm going to do is just get x by itself and write it in one statement. So I'm going to subtract seven from both sides because that's the math that it would take to solve this, to get x by itself, right? Just to subtract seven. That gets x by itself, and then I'm going to have negative 7 plus or minus 2 radical 6. That represents both answers. Negative 7 plus 2 radical 6 would be one answer. Negative 7 minus 2 radical 6 would be the other answer. The reason we split it apart on the example J is because we had a regular number over there. We had a, a 5. Uh, plus or minus five. Those are regular numbers, and we can put those together. Okay. So if it's regular numbers, you can put them together. If it's a a something with a square root or something with an I, then you're going to do it like this. Uh, so let's let's do another one. Okay. L. Let's say we had something like um, negative two x minus four squared plus seven is equal to um, eleven number so this one's got even more stuff going on but Again, the idea is if you're going to solve by square roots, you've got to have something squared. It's got to be the, the focal point of this. And I see that this thing, that, that right there is major red flag for me. It says uh, there's something big squared in this thing. Do something different. Don't, don't factor. Think square roots. Okay? So what do we do first to get that part that I had highlighted to get that by itself? Yeah, I'm going to minus the 7 because it's it's not attached to that at all. So negative 2 parentheses x minus 4 squared is equal to 4. And now what? Can't distribute because of the squared that's on there. Uh, that squared uh, order of operations, technically that squared would have to be worked out first before I would distribute. Distributing is not going to... Uh, would definitely not be uh, helpful in this. There's a quicker way to get rid of that negative two, and that's just to divide by negative two and get rid of it, so that you don't. Ha you're just, it's a lot easier to divide one thing by negative two than it would be to multiply all of that stuff by the negative two. So that's a quicker way to get rid of it, and also the other way you would have to multiply out x minus four times x minus four, simplify that, then multiply by negative two, and then try to fix it, and it. It doesn't work out well. Uh, so here we get x minus 4 squared is equal to negative 2. Now the squared thing is by itself. This big ugly squared thing is by itself now. So I can take the square root of both sides and get rid of the squared so that it's just x minus 4. But what does the square root of negative 2 simplify to be? Plus or minus, and then what comes out? An I and nothing else. So we have I radical 2, and now I need to get X by itself. So how do I get rid of this 4? By what operation? Addition. So adding 4 to both sides gets rid of that. So that's going to be 4 plus or minus I radical 2. So using square roots is handy if you're not in standard form. Okay. And being in standard form, you got to have the AX squared, the BX, and the C and get it equal to 0. Square roots is handy if you don't have that happening. It makes it work out real nice. Okay. Now... The next method is for 
standard form, but what if it won't factor? <laughs> what if it's standard form and won't factor? So uh, this is where we need this thing called the quadratic formula. So first section, guys, I'll go ahead and warn you. The first section has a lot of stuff in it, uh, but we're going to use all of these things in the next two sections uh, to solve equations and, and inequalities with. Uh, so all of these methods are going to be things you're going to need to uh, definitely hang on to because you'll need them for the next stuff that's on uh, that we'll cover in class for the next well, end of the semester. And then you'll need it again in 110. So try to try to latch onto this and retain it. So quadratic formula. It's got to be in standard form. AX squared plus BX plus C. It's got to be equal to zero to use quadratic formula. So factoring and quadratic formula have to be in standard form. Okay, so if it's in standard form, you know you've got these, these two options. Okay. I like to factor because <coughs> probably because I'm decent at it. Uh, you know, some of you are, are pretty good at factoring or you've gotten a lot better at it this semester. Uh, so I usually try that first. If it won't factor or I can't come up with the numbers pretty quick, then I say, okay, well, I'm just going to do quadratic formula. Quadratic formula is this right here. X equals negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4AC. And then that entire thing divided by 2 times A. My high school classes, we sing this to the tune of Row, Row, Row Your Boat. And I've got a really phenomenal group in my first period class right now. There's like half of them are in chorus. So when we did this, they started singing harmony and stuff. It was pretty awesome. Uh, but I, I won't make you guys sing unless you want to. But it, it helps them memorize it because they got a lot of people that are not really good at memorizing. I'm not very good at memorizing things. But uh, if you put something to a tune, it makes it easier to, to remember. Um, so uh, if you want to do that, you can put it to the tune of your favorite, uh, you know, Post Malone song or something like that. If you can, if that does have a tune. I don't know if that has a tune or not. Y'all like Post Malone. Anyway, he's an interesting character. So all of those are just numbers in there. This part right here is a very important piece. That B squared minus 4AC. That B squared minus 4AC is called the discriminant. The discriminant discriminates what kind of answers you'll find. Okay? The discriminant, if it's less than zero, that means it's what kind of number? What kind of numbers are less than zero? Negatives, right? What happens if a negative number is underneath the square root? What kind of answers do we get? Stuff that has what in it? An I, right? The complex things, okay? So if the discriminant is less than zero, then we're going to have complex solutions. If the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, is equal to zero, we're going to have one repeating solution. This is complex solutions. If b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero, means it's positive, we're going to have real solutions. So that's something that you need to know about the discriminant. There are questions that always show up on the final exam that say, what's the discriminant of this quadratic? And they'll ask for that number. What's B squared minus 4AC? And then there are uh, usually another question that'll ask, uh, what does the value of the discriminant tell you about the solutions to this problem? It doesn't ask you to find the solutions. It just says, what's the value of the discriminant tell you about it? 
this is what it means. If it's a negative, they're going to have complex solutions. If it's equal to zero, you're going to have one repeating solution. It's going to be the same answer twice. And then if it's greater than zero, it's a positive number, you're going to have real solutions. So the discriminant, it's important to know those things, okay? So the B squared minus 4AC underneath, the part that's underneath the square root decides what kind of answers you have, okay? And then, then you just finish out the quadratic formula, and it's going to help us find the, what the answers are. Here's the great thing about quadratic formula. It always works. Always. If you do it correctly, it will get you the answers every time. Even if the problem will factor. Even if the problem could be solved by square roots. It'll work. Quadratic formula is the uh, claw hammer of the toolbox. You use a claw hammer to do a lot of things. It can open things up. It can close things up. It can stick things together with nails. It does a lot of things. Quadratic formula does a lot of things for quadratic, for, uh, quadratic equations, okay? It works no matter what, as long as you can do it correctly, okay? So it is a, a probably the best method for solving. So if you stink at factoring, and you still need to try to get better at it because you're going to have to have it as we proceed further in the course. Uh, but the quadratic formula can really, really save you on uh, solving quadratics, and you're going to need to be able to do that as we further on in the, we go further on in the course as well. So being good at quadratic formula is kind of a, 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 it's kind of a big deal. Uh, so make sure uh, you, you really latch on to all of the things we're talking about here. All right, so let's look at an example, and we're going to try to solve it using quadratic formula. <laughs> so I don't know what letter we're on here. M. And let's take something, for example, like x squared um, plus 7x plus 12 is equal to 0. Well, basic. Already equal to 0, in standard form, ready to roll. What I need to know to do quadratic formula is what's A, B, and C. What's A for this problem? It's the number in front of x squared, which is 1. What's B? 7 and C, 12. Notice I'm keeping the sign that's in front of them. I got a positive 7. I got a positive 12. I got a positive 1. So those are all positive. If there were a minus sign in front, you need to keep that minus sign with you. It goes with the number. Okay? So we got A, B, and C. So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do the discriminant separate. That b squared minus 4ac is kind of the most cluttered part of the formula. If I'll do it separate, it'll tell me what kind of answers I'll have, and it'll make it just a lot easier to write out the formula. Okay? So I'm going to do b squared minus 4ac. So b is 7. 4 times a times 12, which is c. So what's 7 squared? 49. 4 times 1 times 12. Be 48, right? What's 49 minus 48? Positive 1. What does that tell me about the answers that I'll have? What kind are they? They're real. Complex would be if it were a negative. If that were a negative number, I would have complex solutions. Because it's a positive one, that means I have real solutions. That means that this thing will cross the x-axis. That's, that's, that's where the big deal comes in. We talked about this when we were factoring that if we graphed it when it was equal to zero, we'd see where it crosses the x-axis. Well, if we got a real solution, that means it'll cross the x-axis. So that's, that's a good thing. That means we can check this, this guy. All right? So let's go do the work in the quadratic formula. X equals negative B. So negative 7 plus or minus 
Now here's where we put the discriminant inside of the square root. Put the one there over two times a. Now all it is is arithmetic and simplifying. That's all this is. So we've got, what's the square root of one? One, right? Two times one is two. I've got, are negative seven and one, are they, can I put those together? They regular numbers? Yeah, they're like, like terms, right? So I could put them together. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to split this apart as the negative 7 plus 1 divided by 2, and then do negative 7 minus 1 divided by 2, and work that out. Negative 7 plus 1 will be negative 6. Divided by 2 is negative 3. There's one of my answers. Negative 7 minus 1 be negative 8. Divided by 2, negative 4. That's my other answer. Huh. I'm going to scroll all the way back up here to example B. And you probably didn't remember this was example B. Same problem. We solved it by factoring back then. We got the same two answers. We solved it this time by quadratic formula. We got the same two answers. It should work that way. No matter wh which method you use to solve it, you better get the same two answers or one of the ways you did it was wrong. Okay? So this one would have factored, but we solved it with quadratic formula and still got the same two answers. That's a good thing. That means, hey, if I can't factor, I can do quadratic formula and still get the right answer. And that means if I can't do quadratic formula, if it'll factor, I can still get the right answer by factoring. So it gives me more options. And sometimes that confuses math students that they have too many roads that they can take and they get confused. It's kind of like driving around. There's no roundabouts here in Parsons, is there? Where's the closest one? Jackson? Yeah, there's one in what? Yeah, over there. And then there's one in uh, Corinth, Mississippi has a roundabout. And Jackson, Tennessee now has a roundabout if you go to downtown. The court square. Yes, court squares are always confusing, too, because there's too many ways to go around and make turns. Sometimes that confuses folks when you have a lot of different ways you can do something and get to the same place. But it's a good thing because that means you can get there different ways and still get the right answer. That means if you're not sure about the way you did it the first time, try one of the other methods. If you get the same answers, then, yeah, you did it right the first time. Okay. Not very likely that you will make the same mistakes and arrive at the same place. Also, what do you know about the graph of this thing? Where does it cross the x-axis at? Negative 3 and negative 4. So if I graph that thing when it's equal to 0, it should show me where it's crossing the x-axis. Okay? Now... You can use that as a shortcut when you're solving some of these things for the quizzes, but understand you're going to need to be able to factor and need to be able to do quadratic formula as well as we proceed through the course. So don't just only rely on that, especially when you get to the ones that have a complex solution. They don't uh, cross the x-axis, so you won't be able to check those that way. So let's look at another one and try to do quadratic formula with it. Uh, x squared minus 4x. Um, plus 6 is equal to um, 4. Is that a good one? A lot of 4s in there. What's wrong with this one? Not equal to 0. So what do we need to do? Take the 4 and get rid of it so that it's get get 0 over there. So I want a zero on that side over there. So I get x squared minus 4x plus 2 is equal to zero. Now I've got it set up to either do factoring or quadratic formula. And I told you that I'm a factoring person because I'm pretty good at it. And it's quicker if it works. If I try to do the x on this thing, is there anything that multiplies to be 2 and adds to be negative 4? 
the best I could do would be negative 2 times negative 1, and that adds to be negative 3. But there are no other options, right, to add to be a negative. So it won't factor. So I don't have that option here. It looks like one that would factor, but it doesn't. So the only option I have is quadratic formula. Okay? So I'm going to do the discriminant. So I need to know what A, B, and C are. So A is 1, B is what? Negative 4, and C is 2. So B squared minus 4AC, that's the part I'm doing right now. So that would be negative 4 squared minus 4 times 1 times 2. It is important if you're going to do this with the graphing calculator, if you're going to type that in, put the negative 4 in parentheses. If you do not, you will miss every one of them that has a negative B value. C is 2. Parentheses 2. So type it in just like that. Hit enter. Our discriminant is 8. What does that tell us about our solutions? Real solutions. Okay. <clears throat> now, set up your quadratic formula. X equals negative B plus or minus radical. B squared minus 4 C divided by C. All right, so B, negative B, what's negative? Negative 4. Positive 4. The opposite would be positive 4. Plus or minus the discriminant under a square root. The 8 goes under the square root. On the bottom, 2 times 1 is 2. Now it's simplifying is the name of the game. So how do I simplify the square root of 8? Do the factor tree thing. Pair of twos. So that's 4 plus or minus 2. Radical 2 over 2. Split it apart. And simplify each fraction. 4 divided by 2. 2. This 2 and that 2 cancel each other out. We get those two solutions. 2 plus the square root of 2. 2 minus the square root of 2. Example O. X squared minus 3X plus 5 is equal to 15. What we got to do first? Get it equal to zero. How do we do that? Track 15. X squared minus 3X minus 10 is equal to zero. Uh, this one will factor. Should be X minus 5 and X plus 2 uh, if you wanted to factor it. But I'm going to do it with quadratic formula just to get us to practice. Okay. Uh, so A, B, C. What's A? 1, B, negative 3, and C, negative 10. All right. So let's do the discriminant. So negative 3 squared minus 4 times A times C. So I'm going to go in parentheses, negative 3, close parentheses squared minus 4 times A times C. Hey, it's 49. That's positive, so we got real solutions here.
That means it will cross the x-axis. That's what that means. All right. Set up your quadratic formula. X equals negative B plus C minus that four. X equals the way it's going to be to A. Okay. Negative B, that's the opposite of negative 3. Positive 3. Plus or minus the square root of the discriminant. The discriminant was 49, so we just put that under a square root. And then divided by 2 times A, 2, two times 1 is 2. So that's where that's coming from. What's the square root of 49? 7. 3 plus or minus 7 over 2. I can split that apart and get good numbers here. 3 plus 7 over 2. 3 minus 7 over 2. 5. And negative 2. If I were to graph x squared minus 3x minus 10, where it's equal to 0, it would cross the x-axis at 5 and negative 2. Got nice numbers on that one. Good to know. So anytime you're going to get nice numbers, <coughs> or at least rational numbers, anytime the discriminant's a square number, where it has a nice square root, like 49, 25, 36, 121, that sort of thing. Uh, you'll get nice number, nice uh, answers when that's happening, okay? Let's do one more, and then we'll go to the applications and the inequalities, and then we'll get the graphs, which we've already kind of got part of already. So. All right. 2x squared plus 3x plus 3 is equal to 4x minus 1. What do we do with this one? Yeah, subtract the 4x and add the 1. Good job. That gets it equal to what? 0, which is important uh, for this problem. Anytime it's a quadratic and it's got the plain x in it, we want to get it equal to 0. If it doesn't have the plain x in it, go to square roots. That's the best way to solve it. Okay. A, B, and C. 2, negative 1, and 4. Negative 1 squared minus 4 times 2 times 4. It's going to be my discriminant. So that's going to be 1 uh, minus 32, which is negative 31. What does that tell us about our solutions? Complex. It tells us that it won't cross the x-axis either. That this one right, that equation right there will not cross the x-axis because it has complex solutions. That's what that tells us too. All right, so we're just going to set up our quadratic formula same way: x equals negative b plus or minus b So that's going to then. So I'm putting the negative 31 underneath the square root. Can we break down 31 in any way? All right, factor tree style. If it were 32, we'd have some options. 31 is a prime number, so it won't break down any. But what will come out of the square root? An i. So we have 1 plus or minus i square root of 31 over 4. I'm going to split that apart and make it 1 fourth plus or minus uh, radical 31 over 4 with the I beside it like that because that's how you're going to see it most often. Put the I on the out 
on the kind of outside with a fraction in front. That's a complex number form is what that is. But uh, if you left it like this right here for the labs, I'm okay with that. But you're likely to see it more like the bottom box on quizzes and, and test stuff. Okay, so it really, really is uh, best to split it apart like that. All right, so quadratic formula, solving by square roots, uh, the discriminant, all of that stuff we have, uh, you know, kind of went over here. We're going to use it now to do a few application problems. We won't get too crazy with application problems. Uh, and then we will do some in some inequalities, which uses the same skills as solving does uh, of equations. But then we got to do a little something else after that. So next section is 1.5 application problems. So we're just going to do a couple of these. A poster as an area of 216 square inches. The width is six less than the length. On the dimensions. <coughs> okay, find the dimensions. All right, so how do you find area of, uh, when you buy a poster board, what shape is it? Rectangle. Most of the time, if I go to the, uh, to the dollar store or to Walmart to buy a poster board, it is rectangle in shape. So if we're dealing with a rectangle, how do you find the area of a rectangle? Length times width. Okay, so we've got we've got some stuff here. We know that the area is how much? All right, so we're going to replace the A with 216 because we know that area, right? What else do we know? The length is six, I mean, the width is six less than the length. So we don't know the length, so we're going to leave that L in there. But we know the width is six less than that. What's the mathematical expression for six less than the length? Swap it around. Six less than the length would be you take the length and take six off of it. So L minus six. So we're, we've set up a problem. So far, it doesn't look quadratic. So let's make it look quadratic. So if I distribute this L, that'd be L squared minus 6L. Now it looks pretty quadratic, right? If I'm going to solve that, what do I need to do? Make it equal zero, yeah, because if I get it to equal zero, it'll be in that standard form, and that'll open up all of the ways of solving quadratic that for a standard form, which is factoring or quadratic formula, right? So I'm going to subtract 216 from both sides. L squared minus 6L minus 216. And I'm going to try to factor that or use quadratic formula uh, to get there. So uh, if we try factoring, uh, negative 216 and add to be negative 6. That's, see, I don't know a lot about 216. But I could take a few stabs at it. Four goes into it. 54 times. That's way too far apart. Let's do uh, 216 divided by 8. A little closer together, but not close enough. Uh, 16 go into it. 
Nope. 32 going to it. Nope. Two sixteen is divisible by nine. Nine and twenty four, eh, still not close enough together. Uh, about eighteen. If nine goes into it, maybe eighteen goes into it. How did I know nine went into it? Y'all know that rule? Without just, it's not because I'm super smart. Because I'm not. The trick to knowing whether a number is divisible by three or nine is to add up the digits. Two plus one plus six is nine. That means that number is divisible by nine or three. Okay. And if it's an even number and it's divisible by three, it's also divisible by six. Uh, so uh, this one, 18 and 12, ends up being the right ones. So go here 18 negative and 12 positive and I can use my shortcut that's one of the reasons that I wanted to try factoring is because I could use the shortcut to factor and that'd be L minus 18 and L plus 12 and then I set each of those equal to zero and solve them Add 18, 18, and all oh, this one's negative. Can link? Can a side of a poster board be a negative number? Nah, throw it away. So if the length is 18 inches, what's the width? Six less than that, right? Because that's what the problem told me, that the width would be six less than the length. So that 18 minus six would be, that's the 12, but it's positive this time. So there are my dimensions. Using quadratic methods to get there. Now, are you ever going to do that probably in life? Nah, probably not. In Math 100? Yeah. Well, I do that. Nobody's ever going to come up to you at Food Giant and ask you to do a quadratic formula. To figure out how much poster board you got. Uh, that I'm not not pretending that that is ever going to happen to you. All right, now let's uh, let's look at this one. Consecutive integers uh, problem, and these are fairly common when you go to applications of quadratics. So consecutive integers. So we're going to find two consecutive. integers whose product is 110. What does consecutive integers mean? Give me an example of two consecutive integers. That don't necessarily have to have a product of 110, but just an example of consecutive integers. Is it like four and five? Yeah, four and five are two consecutive integers. Five and six are consecutive integers. Six and seven would be two consecutive consecutive integers. One right after another. Technically, negative three and negative two are consecutive integers. Since we're talking about integers, it could be negative numbers as well. Out of that, so. Can two consecutive integers whose product is 110. What's product in math? Multiplication. So we don't know what the two numbers are. So let's call the first one X. If the first one's X, what's the next one? If the first one's 5, the next one's 6, right? So how do you get from 5 to 6? You add 1. So if the first one's X, the next one's going to be X plus 1. If it said uh, consecutive odd integers, if the first one's X, the next one would be X plus 2. Same, same 
deal if it was consecutive even. You'd always add two, right? So two consecutive integers would be x and x plus 1, whose product is 110. Hey, that looks a lot like the last problem we just did. Just got an x instead of an L. So that'd be x squared plus x is equal to 1, 1, 0. Oh, get it equal to 0. So we need to uh, multiply to be 110 or negative 110 and add to be 1. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing that last example. Let's do quadratic formula on this one. See if it goes a little faster. So 1, 1, negative 110. So 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 110. So 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 110. Positive 441. That's good. That means I got real solutions. Uh, so that means I'm going to get an answer to this. Uh, so if I set up my quadratic formula, negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 441 over 2. I'm, I'm going to just check to see if 441 happens to be a square number. I got lucky. It is. Okay. So anytime you do a discriminant, and you're, it's an unfamiliar number, check it. See if it's got a square root, a nice square root. They'll, you know, a lot of times it might, uh, but even if it doesn't, at least you know, hey, I tried that. Now I need to try something else, okay? So try to look for those ways of getting there. Uh, so that is 21. So we have negative 1 plus or minus 21 over 2. So I'm going to work that out. Negative 1 plus 21 over 2. And negative 1 minus 21 over 2. So that is going to be positive 10. This is going to be negative 11. Huh. Can both of those work? Because this is X, right, that we're finding. If X is 10, what's the next integer? 11. If x is negative 11, what's the next integer? Negative 10. Both of those are the possible solutions to, the, to this problem. Now, did you have to do a quadratic to get there? No, you could have guessed. Oh, you know, just try, started trying integers and, and worked it out and, and got there. But uh, you know, we're trying to apply some quadratic stuff here, and, you know, give, give you something to work with here. There are some other uh, applications of quadratics. Uh, we don't get too deep in the applications of them in WAF 100. Um, you know, really don't try to get too strenuous with these. Uh, so we won't get into the more uh, challenging uh, applications of those. Uh, you can, my uh, kids at, in college algebra at my high school they they get the challenging ones they they're not fans of them so i'm sure y'all won't mind not doing them all right let's look at inequalities so this takes everything the same same stuff we just did and with solving equations and then applies it to inequalities and there's just one more step that you got to do after you solve it for the inequality stuff okay so let's look at an example. X squared minus X minus 12 is less than zero. Okay. <clears throat> so it's a quadratic. <clears throat> the same kind of rules apply as if you're going to solve the equation. You want to get zero on one side and work it out like it was an equation. Solve the equation that goes with it. Okay, get what X would be. This one, uh, I think would be a good candidate for factoring. So multiply to be negative 12, add to be negative 1. Since the numbers are not real big, I'm probably not going to have to guess a whole lot at this to try. Uh, 
what numbers multiply to be negative 12 and add to be negative 1? Negative 4 and positive 3, right? Negative 4 times 3 is negative 12. Negative 4 plus 3 is negative 1. Can I use the shortcut on the factoring? Yeah. X minus 4, X plus 3. And I set each of those equal to 0. X equals 4, X equals negative 3. Those are the two solutions to the equation if it were equal to zero. Now, here's where we've got to do a little bit of uh, extra work because it's an inequality. Because it's an inequality, you have to set up these intervals on a number line. And it's really not, it sounds like it's a lot of work, but it's really not. It's, it's pretty quick and easy. So what you want to do is you set up a number line, and then you're going to put these two solutions that you found on the number line. So we got negative three and then positive four. I'm just going to put those. We're not going to put uh, any other numbers up there. No. Now, because it doesn't have an equal to mark, it's just less than, those are going to be open circles on there. So open circles means negative three and positive four are not solutions to the inequality uh, because it doesn't have an equal to. We found where it was equal to zero. This one doesn't have that. If it had an equal to mark, you fill in those dots. If the inequality had an equal to mark, you fill in the dots. Okay? Now, there are three areas we need to check. We need to check numbers that are here, numbers that are here, and numbers that are here. We just need to check one in each area. Okay? So we need to check a number that's that's less than negative three. Give me a number that's less than negative four. Negative four. That's the easiest one to check, right? So I'm going to check negative four in the inequality. Okay. So I'm going to use my calculator to help me. I'm going to say negative four squared minus negative four minus. 12. I'm just plugging that in. I got 8. Is 8 less than 0? No, 8 is not less than 0. So this area is false. That means it's not a solution. Okay? Those the answers that are less than negative 3 are not answers. They don't work. Now I need to check the area in between negative 3 and positive 4. What would be a really easy number that's between negative 3 and positive 4 to plug in? Zero is between those. One would also be easy. I think zero would be even easier because I could just plug a zero in here and a zero in here, and those go away, and I get negative 12 is less than zero. Is negative 12 less than zero? Yes. So this area is true. I've still got to check this other area because it's possible that this area is true and this area is true. So I need to check a number that's bigger than four. So what is the number that's bigger than four? Five. So I'm going to check. I checked zero here. I'm going to check five here. And I'm going to work that out. So parentheses five squared minus parentheses five minus 12. I'm going to work that. Oh, I got eight again. Is 8 less than 0? No. Okay. So this was negative 12 is less than 0. So this is false. So the answer, the solution set, is what it's called, is the interval from negative 3 to 4. And it's parentheses on those because those are open circles. If they were filled in circles, it'd be the square bracket thing. Okay? This is an interval, not an ordered pair. It's an interval. From negative 3 to positive 4. Any number that's between those two works for this inequality. That's what we're finding out there. All right? Now, <clears throat> let's try another one. 2x squared 
plus 5x is greater than or equal to 12. All right. What's wrong with this? There's not a zero on one side. I need to get a zero on one side. I'm going to move the 12. It's 2x squared plus 5x minus 12 is greater than or equal to zero. I'm going to solve that like it was an equation so that I can get my interval set up. This one has a 2 in the front of x squared. Uh, I need something that multiplies to be 24, negative 24, and has to be 5. Um, and then I'll have to do grouping and all that. So I'm just going to go to do quadratic formula. A is 2, B is 5, and C is negative 12. So 5 squared times 4 times 2 times negative 12. That's going to be my discriminant. So I'm going to work that out. 5 squared is 4 times 2 times negative 12. My discriminant is 121. So that's nice. So when I go to solve that, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of 121 over 2 times 2. Negative 5 plus or minus 11 over 4, which will work. Those are nice, no, going to be nice numbers. So negative 5 plus 11 over 4, negative 5 minus 11 over 4. So that'd be negative 6 over 4, which is 3 over 2. And this would be negative 16 over 4, which is negative 4. So those are the numbers. And I'm going to put on my number line, negative 4 and 3 over 2. I'm going to put filled in circles on those numbers because it has an equal to mark in the inequality. So that when I write my answers, I'm going to have to have some brackets on. Okay? Because those are, those negative 4 and that 3 over 2 are uh, equal to part of the inequality. All right? Now, I need to check numbers in each area. So I need a number that's less than negative 4, a number that's between negative 4 and 3 over 2, and the number that's bigger than 3 over 2. So I'm just going to pick numbers that do that. So negative 5, I'll pick 0 again, and then uh, 2, and work those out. So I'm going to say uh, negative Negative 5, I'm going to store it as x. Negative 5, store x. And then I'm going to type in 2x squared plus 5x minus 12. It gets me 13. So my question is, is 13 greater than 0? Yes. Yeah. So this area is true. And here's the beauty of doing the store thing. Now, if I'll do zero store as x, then go back up here and grab that, just hit enter. Now it's going to say, okay, I'm going to work that out with a zero in the place of x. And I get negative 12. Is negative 12 greater than or equal to zero? No. So this area is false. And then I'm going to do 2 store as x. Go up here and grab that. Here. Get a 6. 6 greater than 0. Yes. So this one has two regions that are true. And one that is false. So my solution set...
would be from negative infinity to 4, or excuse me, to negative 4 with a bracket, union, bracket, from 3 over 2 to positive infinity. We're skipping that little section in the middle there, what that tells us to do. Quadratic inequalities, all the solving part is just like equations, getting the numbers that go on your number line. But then you got to check different numbers to, to get the solution set out of that. So, uh, again, it goes back to you got to be able to solve the uh, inequality or the equations to be able to do any of this stuff. Okay. All right. One last thing. I know it's a long night tonight, but I've had some time off. I've had some time off. We got to, yep, don't have a lot of time left, so we got to do what we can do. All right. Let's talk about quadratic functions, and we're going to talk about graphs and some pieces uh, to those graphs. All right. F of X is equal to AX squared plus bx plus c. What form is that? It's that standard form that we looked at. The only difference is it's not equal to zero. It's equal to f of x, which is the same thing as y. Okay? So what we're talking about is a graph of a quadratic. <coughs> the graph of a quadratic, a, if a is greater than zero, means it's a positive number, then it opens upward. And has a minimum. If A is less than zero, it's negative. It opens downward. and has a maximum. This is what the graph in general looks like. If A is positive, it's going to look something like that. If A is negative, it's going to look something like that. Maybe skinnier, maybe taller, maybe move you around some, but that's the general shape. Okay, it's a U-shaped thing called a parabola is the shape of the graph. Uh, and A, what sign A is decides which way this thing opens and whether it has a minimum or a maximum. So if A is positive, it's going to open upward. You score a touchdown. Positive points. Up. You have a minimum value, and that minimum value is right there at that spot. If you know, A is negative, it's going to open downward. You're going to have a maximum value it's right there at that spot. Okay? So A decides all of that stuff. No other, the B and the C don't have anything to do with that. Just the A decides that. Okay? Now, in that graph, there's this imaginary line. It goes right through the center of those things. That imaginary not line is called the axis of symmetry. The axis of symmetry can be found by doing x equals negative b divided by 2a. It is an equation of a line, so it has to have the x equals and negative b divided by 2a. That should look familiar. Uh, it is part of the quadratic formula that that, that is involved with. Okay? x equals negative b divided by 2a. The minimum or maximum value is at the vertex. The vertex is an ordered pair. Okay. 
<coughs> the notation I'm using here, here is the x value. Notice it's exactly the same as that. If you find the axis of symmetry, you've got the x value in the vertex. Two to one deal. Okay? I want to get one through. All right? And then this, what does f of negative b over 2a, what does the f of part mean? It means y. So, so you just plug that in for x. That's right. You, that's the x value. You plug it in, you work it out. That gets you the ordered pair for the vertex. The ordered pair of the vertex is where the maximum or the minimum occurs. Okay? Maximum or minimum will be at the vertex. Okay? So vertex is either the max or min. Okay? X intercepts. This is the tie together. What we've been doing all night with the graph. Where what are we finding when we solve the equation set equal to zero? Where it crosses the x-axis. When we try to tie that together in that first section, we were going over. This is where it goes together. The x-intercepts are where you're going to set the equation equal to zero and solve it. So AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. Solve. Those are where it crosses the X axis. If it crosses the X axis, it doesn't have to. A lot of them do, but not every one of them does. The only other thing we're going to find are Y intercepts or Y intercept. How do you find the Y intercept uh, of any equation? What do you plug in in a place of x to find the y intercept? Plug in a zero in the place of x. No matter what kind of equation you have, it could be any equation. If you plug a zero in the place of x, you're going to find the y intercept. So for us, for this one, we're going to plug a zero in the place of x into this problem. And if that's the case, c is the only thing that's going to be left. So the y intercept, if it's in standard form, is going to be at zero c. So it's always going to be the c value if it's in standard form. Okay. Now, let's look at an example of one that's in standard form. And see if we can find this stuff. Okay. So f of x is equal to x squared plus 6x plus 8. We're going to find the axis of symmetry. We're going to find the vertex. We'll also find whether it's a maximum or minimum. And we're going to find the x-intercepts, y-intercepts, and then we're going to look at the graph. We're going to use the graphing calculator to help us look at the graph and instead of drawing it out one, you know, one table <laughs> or one point at a time okay so to find the axis of symmetry it's always going to be the formula negative b divided by 2a okay if it's in standard form that's where it's going to be so negative b would be negative 6 2 times a would be 2 times 1 so that would be negative 3 so the axis of symmetry is x equals negative 3 that gives us the y or the x value of the vertex automatically. Negative three, whatever the axis of symmetry is, the vertex will have the same number as the x value. Always. Those are always. If, when we do a vertex form in a minute, we'll get the vertex first, 
and the vertex x value gives you the axis of symmetry automatically without any work. Okay, so you get a two for one deal there. How do we get the y value that goes with that x value? Hmm. I'm going to plug in negative 3 for x. Everywhere there's an x, I'm going to put a negative 3. That's what I want to do to get the y value. Anytime you need to find a y value, you plug the x value in for x and work it out. So negative 3 squared would be 9 minus 18 plus 8. So that will be negative 1. So the y value of the vertex is negative 1. Is that a maximum or a minimum? What's A? Positive 1, right? If A is positive, which way does this thing open? Upward or downward? Upward. A is positive, it opens up. So if it opens up, that means that this is going to be at the bottom of the little u. So that's going to be a minimum. Okay. Just takes a little practice. You'll, you'll get the hang of that. Now, now the part that we, we've been working on all evening, the x-intercepts. How do we find x-intercepts? Set the problem equal to what? Zero. And solve that thing by either it's in standard form, so what are my options? Quadratic formula or factoring. Okay. So I'm gonna try factoring first. Maybe it works. So multiply to be eight, add to be six. What does that? Four and two. Hey, I found the numbers pretty quick. So that means I'm uh, factoring's going to work here. So I could do x plus four, x plus two. So x equals negative four, x equals negative two. So my x-intercepts are at negative four and negative two. So when I graph this thing on my calculator, I'm going to see it crossing the x-axis at those two numbers. Okay. If I had solved this with quadratic formula, I'd get the same two answers. How do I find a y-intercept? <laughs> Set x to zero. So I'm going to plug a zero in for x. So that's going to be zero squared plus six times zero plus eight. That's so going to be zero, eight. So when I graph this in just a second with my calculator, I'm going to see it cross the x-axis at negative 4 and negative 2. I'm going to see it cross the y-axis at positive 8. I'm going to see it have a minimum at this ordered pair, negative 3, negative 1. I'm going to see it open up because A was positive. And then the axis of symmetry is that imaginary line that if I folded the graph on that line, it would match up perfectly. That's what an axis of symmetry means. So let's go to our calculator and look at the graph. Y equals, and I'm just clearing out anything I've got and just putting in X squared plus 6X plus 8. Hitting graph. All right, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking to verify all those points. Where's it crossing the X axis? Negative 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and negative 2, right there. It's crossing the Y axis. It's supposed to be crossing at 8. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And there it is. So three of them. Right. Sounds like it's about right. Where's the vertex supposed to be? Negative three. So I go over here to negative three, and then down here to negative. That looks like negative one, doesn't it? It's the right spot. Okay. You can see that if I folded this graph, if I could take this picture and fold it right along this line right here that it would match up perfectly on each side. That's that axis of symmetry that we're finding. It's opening up. A is positive. That's what happens when, when A is positive. It opens up like that. This is a minimum value. It's the lowest value on the graph. If it opened downward, 
then you would flip over and you'd have a highest point on the graph. Everything's done the same way. So if it's in standard form, you're going to follow those steps to get all of those pieces. Okay. So let's look at one that's not in standard form. That's in what we call vertex form. Okay. And vertex form, the name implies that what would be the easiest thing to find? The vertex. So that's what we're going to find really easily from vertex form. So vertex form. f of x is equal to a parentheses x minus h squared plus k. This a that's right there is exactly the same as the a from standard form. It has all of the same powers. It decides whether this thing opens upward, opens downward. If it's positive, it's up. If it's negative, it's down. It does the exact same things. Okay, the vertex and the axis of symmetry. Remember, those are tied together. The vertex is going to be at the ordered pair HK. So you take the opposite of what was in parentheses, and then the same thing as what was on the outside. So we're going to do an example with numbers in here. It'll make sense. And then the axis of symmetry, remember, is always going to be x equals the same x value as the vertex. And we're still going to do max or min on the vertex, depending on what a is. If a is positive, it's going to be a minimum. If a is negative, it's going to be a maximum. Okay. We're still going to do x-intercepts. Solve it by square roots. We did some problems like this when we were working on solving by square roots on purpose. Okay, when we do an example, you're gonna be it should feel somewhat familiar. Hey, we've done problems like that already, so I, I can find the x-intercepts. Okay, the y-intercept. How do you find the y-intercept of any equation? Plug a x in that's zero, and so you're gonna get y. It's going to be some number. Well, it'll be. It won't be C or K in this case. It's just going to be something different. Okay, so we got to work it out. All right. So let's look at an example of something that's in vertex form. All right. Let's do one that opens down. G of X is equal to negative two parentheses X plus five squared plus eight. All right, so we're dealing with a vertex form of that. And, you know, just to keep at the forefront what vertex form looks like, since it's it's fairly new to us. We haven't done a lot of work with vertex form in the past. Probably done uh, more work with standard form. Um, so that's what it looks like. So we're going to find those things. We're going to find the axis of symmetry. We'll find the vertex. And the good news is, is I don't have to do any work to find those things. I just got to know, I've got to have some knowledge. Okay, I don't have to, to be able to work out a math problem to, to do it. I just need to know what vertex form looks like. So the vertex is going to be HK. And it's always gonna, you're always going to take the opposite of what's in here. So this is a plus 5. So when I go to use it for my vertex, I'll make it a negative 5. Okay, always the opposite of the stuff in the parentheses. So negative 5, and then the same thing that's on the outside, so plus 8. So negative 5, positive 8. The axis of symmetry always matches the x value of the vertex. 
because it's in vertex form, we get the vertex by just pulling it out. We don't have to do a math problem to get it. It's just there. Okay. Now, what's A for this problem? So which direction does this thing open? Down. So it's going to go down. So that means the vertex is going to be a maximum or a minimum? Maximum. Because it opens down, you're going to have this peak there at negative 5, 8. So this is going to be a maximum. Now, the hard part on every one of these is going to be the x intercepts. It's the one, it's the part that makes, that has the most work involved, is finding x intercepts. So, this one, you've got negative 2, x plus 5 squared plus 8, and you're setting it equal to 0 to find the x intercepts. No matter what form it's in, that's how you find x intercepts. You set the problem equal to 0. Okay? I want to solve it by square roots. So what part of this do I need to get by itself? The x plus 5 squared. This is squared stuff. I need to get it by itself. So how do I do that? I'm going to have to move this negative 2, but before I do that, I need to get rid of this 8 because it's a like term with the, with the 0 there, right? So I'm going to move that 8 by subtraction. Negative 2, parentheses, x plus 5 squared is equal to negative 8. And then I'm going to divide by the negative 2 to get rid of it. Okay, so I'm removing everything that's not with that parentheses or not on the inside of that parentheses. Okay? x plus 5 squared is equal to 4. That's a positive 4 now. Negative 8 divided by negative 2 is positive 4. Now the squared part by itself, I can take the square root of both sides to get rid of that squared. So give me x plus 5 is equal to plus or minus. The square root of 4 is 2. So I've got positive 2 and negative 2. So x plus 5 equals positive 2. x plus 5 equals negative 2. And work that out. There's negative 3, and there's negative 7. So when I graph this thing in just a second, I better see it crossing the x-axis at negative 3 and negative 7. Okay? I better see it having the, the highest point at negative 5 and positive 8. <clears throat> and then what else do we need to find? The y-intercept. That's the last thing we want to find. How do I find a y-intercept? <coughs> Plug in what for x? Zero. Negative two, zero, plus five, squared, plus eight. So that'd be negative two times five squared. It'd be negative two times 25. Ooh, this is going to be a big y-intercept. That'd be negative 50 plus 8, which is negative 42. Zero, negative 42. Not very likely that I'm going to be able to see that when I graph this, but I'm going to be able to see all this other stuff. And it should, I should be able to tell if it's going down there toward negative 42 uh, to get the right picture. So I'm going to go to my graphing calculator now. Y equals... And I'm typing in the problem, negative 2, parentheses, x plus 5, close parentheses, squared, plus 8. I'm hitting graph. Bam. Where is it crossing the x-axis? Negative 3, negative 7. Same one that I found. Negative square roots. Good. Negative 5, positive 8. So negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, positive 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's the virtual chain. Okay. If I folded it right along that line, it'd match up. Does this look like eventually it'd get down here to like negative 42? 
Yeah, it, it really does look like a glue. Okay, uh, so we can find all of those pieces. We know it's got a maximum because that's the highest point on the graph out of that. Here's a little tie together. Look at the vertex. Where is it at in relation to the x-intercepts? Above it if it's a maximum. Below it if it's a minimum. Where is it at left or right of those? So our x-intercepts are here at negative 3 and positive 7. I mean negative 7, excuse me. The vertex is right here. Where's that at in relation to those x-intercepts? It's right in the middle. It's in between them, but it's exactly in the middle. It's at the midpoint of those two things. The x value is the midpoint of the intercepts. The x -intercepts. Um, not that you have to know that, but it is a nice thing to kind of tie it all together that that's what's happening every single time. If I know the x-intercepts, the vertex is halfway between them. If I know the vertex, I know the x-intercepts should be right, exact, you know, perfectly to each side of that, okay? So that stuff is the graphs. Be able to graph it with the graphing calculator. That's going to help you a lot. Uh, understand that where it crosses the x-axis and the solutions when it's equal to zero are the same things. Uh, those, those sort of things are important. So... Uh, for the first section that we did, uh, which was what, one four, one through sixty nine, eighty three through ninety one odds on those, one uh, five, I believe it's right, which is the application, uh, one through forty nine odd, don't. Don't stress yourself out about the application problems. The inequalities, there aren't a lot of those available to practice on, but they're there. And then three, section three, four, I believe is the name of this section. Three, one. Um, one through 83. I'll send out a message to you in the next couple of days, uh, let you know kind of the plan of attack. Uh, everything that's on the next exam, we've covered. We will need to do labs next week. Uh, so uh, I'm, I got to make the decision about what we're going to do. If we're going to do labs and then a test or labs and then the next lecture and then you do your test online. Uh, I haven't decided that yet. So uh, I'll decide that and let you know. And uh, you guys have a great week. Shoot me an email if you got questions, uh, concerns, things going on, okay?